I'm Selma Polo, Executive Director Emerita of USC Museums and USC Art History Professor Emerita. I'm so pleased to welcome all of you to Visions and Voices to this special event sponsored by the USC Roski School and the Dean Haven LeCurk is here. Can you see her? And, um, and also the USC School of Cinematic Arts. So this is just a wonderful, a wonderful um, partnership to be able to bring this evening to you. Tonight we will present first a talk by the prominent contemporary artist Enrique Martinez Celaya about his work. His presentation will be followed by a conversation between him and acclaimed movie director Martin Brest. I'm looking forward, as I'm sure all of you are, to Enrique launching this conversation by sharing some of his thoughts on authenticity, on the nature of his art practice, and on the thinking that guides him, the thoughts, the feelings that move him. Before I take a few minutes of your time to introduce both Enrique and Martin, I want to offer a quick personal reflection. When I was growing up, the finest thing you could say about a man was that he was a gentleman and a scholar. I added to that list of values the word artist. Enrique Martinez Celaya is one of those rare people who actually is a gentleman. He is a scholar and he is a great artist to boot. To sum it up, Enrique is a mensch. <laughs> and now for the details of who Enrique Martinez Celaya is and what he res represents to us and why we're all here today. Enrique is an artist, an author, a former physicist, and the first provost professor of humanities and arts in the history of USC. His work has been exhibited and reflected by major institutions around the world, and he is the author of eight books on art, philosophy, and poetry. He holds four scientific patents and has created projects and exhibitions for the State Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, the Phillips Collection in Washington, and the Museum der Bildung der Kunst in Leipzig, among many others. Enrique's work is held in 57 public collections internationally, among them the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Moderna Museet in Stockholm, and the USC Fisher Museum of Art. Many of you know and saw on the screen his fabulous sculpture, The Well, which stands at the entrance to the Fisher Museum. This work was commissioned by our great friend, Mei Ne, who is here tonight, and um, for whom I'm forever grateful for her support, for Enrique, for us, for, for, for USC. But working on that sculpture together with her and Enrique was just one of the great moments of my life, so thank you. Mary. Additionally, Martina Celaya is a Roth, a distinguished visiting scholar at, at Dartmouth College, where he also is a Montgomery Fellow, he was awarded an honorary doctorate from Otis College of Art and Design and a presidential uh, professorship from the University of Nebraska. Additionally, Martina Celaya is the first visual arts fellow of the Huntington Library Art Museum and Botanical Gardens and the first fellow of the Robinson Jeffers Torhouse Foundation. He received his degrees from Cornell University, the University of California, Berkeley, the University of California, Santa Barbara in both physics and art. He's joined here tonight by his brand new wife, Stacy Cohen. Stacy, please stand up so we can welcome you as well. Thank you for being here. And now I want to say a few words about his great friend and colleague, Martin Brest. Martin will follow Enrique up on the stage for the conversation we are all eagerly awaiting. After the conversation, you will be able to participate in a Q&A period which Marty and Enrique will lead. Marty Brest is a renowned American film director whose career has left an indelible mark on Hollywood. Brest gained critical and commercial success with his third film, Beverly Hills Cop, that was in 1984. 
starring Eddie Murphy, which became one of the highest grossing films of the year and earned Breast a Golden Globe nomination for Best Director. He followed with Midnight Run in 88, a comedy starring, starring Robert De Niro and Charles Brody, which was also a box office hit and received critical acclaim. In 1992, Breast directed Scent of a Woman, a drama about a blind retired lieutenant colonel played by Al Pacino, which earned Pacino his first Academy Award for Best Director and Breast an Oscar nomination for Best Director. Breast continued to direct successful films throughout the 90s, including Meet Joe Black in 98 and starring Brad Pitt. In addition to his work as a director, Breast is a collector of contemporary art, so he knows whereof he speaks, and a longtime friend and collector of Martina Celaya's work with a deep understanding and appreciation of Enrique's vision and creative process. Breast's film career and passion for art and his contributions to both fields have made him a respected and influential figure in contemporary culture at large. Please join me in welcoming now Enrique Martinez Celaya as he opens our vision and voices evening tonight. Thank you, Selma, for your introduction and for your love and friendship. Thank you to all of you for this evening, for being here, for being here this evening. I see students and friends here tonight, as well as my family, Carlos, Stacy, Adrian, uh, and Meili. Um, I would like to thank the University of Southern California, Roski School of Art and Design, the School of Cinematic Arts, and their deans, Haven Lynn Kirk and Elizabeth Daly, as well as Robin Romans and Daria Yudakovsky for the, from the provost's office. I would also like to thank my studio, Diana, Katie, Sophia, Robin, and David. It is an honor and a delight to share this evening with my friend Marty Brest, whom I deeply admire. As an introduction to the conversation with Marty, I'm going to talk for about 20 to five minutes. Since it's, it's not a lot of time, I have chosen to focus on three snapshots of my career that illustrate a few key concerns. I could have chosen other moments that articulate different aspects of my work, but I feel these three will be best for this context. The first of these is my childhood. Until I was seven, I lived in a small Cuban country town near the Caribbean Sea. This was shortly after the Cuban Revolution and my family, whose lives had been shattered, both to leave as soon as the government allowed. My father was granted permission to leave first, and while my mother, my brother, and I waited for our turn, we lived in an in-between world. To emphasize our lack of belonging and betrayal of the communist ideals, we were publicly labeled worms. During this liminal period, I wrote letters to my father, which I have now because he kept them. In these letters, I told him stories of our lives, asked for things that could never come, and tried to show how I was turning to such a man at the age of seven. I'm not sharing this with you for nostalgic reasons, but because all the letters had drawings and these drawings already suggested some of the concerns I would later try to articulate more fully. Of these, perhaps the most influential to my outlook was and is the trust that images and narratives matter. In 1972, we finally left for Spain, and a few years later, we moved to Puerto Rico. From the moment I sat in that Iberia plane, the in-between world would become the vantage point from which I approached the world and tried to find my place in it. My interest in drawing continued, 
and I became an apprentice for a painter at the age of 12. It was a classical training consistent of helping around the studio, formal classes in drawing and painting from observation, and the occasional conversation about art. I was seven when I wrote the letter and 13 when I completed this painting. In those six years, I learned to rely on art to make sense of my awkward teenage years and of being an exile in the Puerto Rico of the 1970s, a time of political and social turmoil and strain by a poor economy and colonial tensions. During those years, I also developed expectations, which I still hold, that art could be a means to create order in the face of chaos and discover something about the way things are. Despite these insights, I still felt I didn't know much. I was fortunate, though, that the political fervor of the island and a few mentors introduced me to philosophers, theorists, authors, scientists, and practices that broadened my perspective. Philosophy shook many of my values and made me conscious of the difficulty and importance of thinking clearly. Literature provided me with an emotional education and the foundation for my intellectual ambition. Intellectual ambition. Science made me feel more ordered than I was and showed me the world was complex and mysterious. I was fortunate that one of those mentors I mentioned encouraged me to work in a physics lab in ninth grade and the experience there helped me to build a laser a year later. By the time I finished high school, I had a basic understanding of how and why art and literature meant something to me and of what I wanted to avoid. For example, during my years as an apprentice studying art, I had encountered numerous instances of hollow artistic hostilities and inauthenticity, attitudes that saw as stemming from resignation and powerlessness. powerlessness. <coughs> In contrast, the art and literature I admired were authentic, self-aware, emotionally and intellectually engaging, and offer glimpses of an order beyond my everyday experiences. I am not contrasting inauthenticity and hollow hostility with meaningful art to suggest the excellence of my own work. The reality is that most art, my own included, falls short of being great or even good. I stress the importance of the example set by great literature and great and art because they offer a counterpoint to meaninglessness, something that trends, market values, and peer approval cannot provide. The decade following high school was a whirlwind. I came to America for college, worked at two physics labs, and pursued what ultimately abandoned a doctorate in physics while working on my dissertation. I painted as much as I could and tried to sell my paintings in the parks of San Francisco, an experience less glamorous than it sounds, <laughs> before completing my MFA and establishing an art career. I published a book of poetry that were modestly received and moved to Los Angeles, where I became a professor at Pomona College and Claremont Graduate University. But throughout these transitions, my aspirations to create an emotional emotionally and intellectually ambitious work of art, incorporating art, poetry, architecture, philosophy, and writing into a singular cohesive experience remain a goal. Fortunately, as my career developed, I had several opportunities to explore the concept in practice. I will, dis discuss, three such, I will discuss three such instances, which I have grouped due to their shared reference to a bed. In 1997, I was asked to create an artistic intervention in a room at the Chateau Marmont here in LA. I recognized the opportunity to do more than just create a simple installation. I saw it as my chance to bring together poetry, art, sound, architecture, history, and audience interaction into a total work of art. Instead of dramatically transforming the hotel room, I opted for a subtle alteration. I carved the creek into the bed, dividing it into two halves, and collected the water falling in a basin. In this basin, I placed cooking pots and dishes. 
which appear to serve as counters of time and markers of domestic wear and tear. Except for replacing two wall decorations with my drawings, I made no other changes to the room. When people entered, it took them a moment to realize that anything was different. Typically, it was the sound of the water cascading over the dishes that alerted them to what was happening. I understood that bed with its flowery cover as a map of losses of what were once, lo what were once loved. While themes of relationship, loss, and memory may be evident, eliciting a few thought-provoking ideas was not my aim. What I sought to create was something meaningful, capable of generating in a few visitors a deep emotional response. But to create something meaningful, artists must be, must be mindful to avoid generalities and be aware of their own limitations and arrogance. This is a point worth elaborating as it ties into what I value in an art practice. Consider this conversation between Heide Zuckerman, then director of the Aspen Art Museum, and the artist Rashid Johnson. Following up on his remarks about liking to be in the studio to see what solutions come up for the problems he's thinking about, Zuckerman asked Johnson, what kinds of problems are you thinking about? To which he responded, if you can think of an ism, I'm probably thinking about that ism. I use this example not because it is uncommon, but precisely because it's so common. If you have been around the art scene for a while, it probably doesn't surprise you that some believe solutions to complex isms can just come up, or that such quick fixes can produce meaningful art solely because they address significant issues. In the novel, The World, the, the world of the World, the world of the end of the world, La Guerra del Fin del Mundo. Uh, Mario Vargas Llosa writes, it is easier to imagine the death of one person than those of a hundred or a thousand. When multiplied, suffering becomes abstract. It is not easy to be moved by abstract things. The abstraction of multiplied suffering, much like the solutions to isms, allows for ample discussion theorizing and shallow remedies for social injustices. However, deep transformative connections are not brought about by isms or abstractions. Instead, they arise through an intimate recognition of the feelings, hopes, fears, and failures we share. Experiences of this kind shake us, often leaving us worldless, sometimes tearless, the silence is not the only starting point for art, but it's likely the most fruitful if we're seeking meaning that outlasts the distractions of trends. Even when a meaningful work of art appears to engage with collective suffering, such as war, it invariably unveils the visceral individual experience within the abstraction. Here is an example by the Swedish poet Thomas Transgrove. I will pause, pause so you can read it. Seven years later, in 2004, I returned to the bed as both metaphor and stage upon an invitation to collaborate with the Berlin Philharmonic. This collaboration presented an opportunity to merge my desire for a total work of art with my long-standing interest in Beethoven's convalescent period and my concerns about navigating regrets, especially in the light of Heidegger's thoughts on the bed of death and his imparted urgency to the present. The work I created for the Berlin Philharmonic consisted of two rooms. The first was an antechamber with a single chair, a compressor system, and my writings on the walls. The second room included a frozen, snow-covered bed, a large starter and feather painting of a birch forest, and a broken birch branches from the Tiergarten, the Berlin Park across from the Philharmonic. 
The experience of the installation also incorporated the music played by the orchestra, which had a remarkable program that year. For instance, for the inauguration, they played Beethoven's Symphony No. 9, which a composer originally hoped to first perform in Berlin before it was eventually premiered in Vienna. I revisited the concept of a bed nearly a decade later, in 2013, when I created the comprehensive installation, The Pearl, for Sci Santa Fe. The Pearl, partially an exploration of homesickness, comprised over 800 objects, including paintings, videos, photographs, sculptures, and projections, as well as music, sensors, and sounds. I conceived this work as a multidimensional map charting the secrets of deserted homes and the memories they contained. In one of the sculptures in the Pearl, the cascade, which was made of pine needles, the landscape suggested the bed, so the, the landscape suggested by the bed, the creek, and Schnippe were embodied, juxtaposing the interiority of the bed with the external world. Here, rather than a solitary bed, five beds channel the tears. Like the beds that preceded it, the cascade might be dismissed as sentimental or as parody. Yet this initial dismissal is part of what interests me. Not as a means of signaling irony to the viewer through a knowing wink, but for its inherent value. I see the recognition of both vulnerability and the inadequacy of, the, of our means as the starting point for authentic artwork. From this frank assessment, we endeavor to forge meaning and clarity. These three projects and the works I made in between have underscored the idea that my, any piece, whether it's a complex installation or, or a single painting, is part of a larger dynamic framework. Let me now show how this inclusive approach to art making has evolved since by looking at a selection of my recent paintings. Although I didn't use these words to describe what I was doing, from my early drawings and paintings, I have been interested in how painting can either assist or detract in the creation of meaning. To achieve this in painting, while avoiding the theatrical elements of narrative, I have relied on poetry as a guide. I also adopt an approach to art in which I'm always a beginner willing to reinvent and question my practice and my assumptions about art. I don't think of my work in terms of themes, but if there is a theme in these recent paintings, it is the foreigner's dual longing for a future that can redeem the dislocation of the past and for a present that can provide a sense of belonging. I'm thinking of the term foreigner in an existential way rather than a social label. As I have come to understand, the loss of native land, family, or language is not what makes one a foreigner. It is not specific conditions that turn us into foreigners. Rather, all of us are inherently foreigners, foreigners in search of a home where we can finally settle. The advantage, the advantage exiles have, if we can be called that, is that the recognition of always having been a foreigner is expedited. As you have seen, I use recognizable images as my paintings, in my paintings and sculptures, and I depend on the associations these images generate and the poetry they can evoke. I'm also interested in the mysterious quality that images possess once we move beyond our assurance that we know them. Although relatively easy to describe superficially, Secrets always lurk in the image of the sea, the house, or the stars. Few things are what they seem, especially when considered in relation to other things. And if a work of art or a poem is good, it cannot be reduced to this symbol means this, or this image comes from that. Some people feel compelled to interpret paintings, and in the case of figurative work, they often engage in translating iconography into symbols and words into whatever theory is in fashion, as well as sifting through the artist's biography for causes and clues. 
For me, however, art is an inquiry where images and personal history are the means and not the ends. The aim of my work is not to deliver a message, a story with a moral or a cultural revelation, but to offer a holistic experience that cannot be reduced to components and that moves me emotionally and intellectually by uncovering insights not apparent beforehand. Yet resonant, meaningful paintings are always more than the sum of their parts. So what matters most about them is rarely on the surface. A resonant, meaningful painting is mysterious and elusive, but eloquently opens a clearing for meaning that awakens us from our slumber, even if only for a moment. His revelation appears as if the artist uncovers something that simply is, rather than something that became. Or, to put it another way, as if meaning was discovered rather than created. Paintings with those qualities must begin with the artist's heart. Artists who approach painting without investing who they are, maybe by relying on facile solutions to isms or by following trends, make intellectual dioramas or decorative paintings. Occasionally, a great visual impact. However, it is crucial that the artist's heart is used up as fuel in bringing about a transcendent experience. If, instead of dispersing as energy, the heart of the artist remains the central point of the work, then the painting doesn't go beyond being didactic or cathartic. The more subjectively and authentically an artist is in the work, the more he or she will be absent, T.S. Eliot wrote. T.S. Eliot wrote, the more perfect an artist, the more completely separate in him will be the man who suffers and the mind which creates. The more perfectly still will the mind digest and transmute the passions which are its materials. That separation demands both authenticity and a sense of morality. When I speak of morality, I am not alluding to content or the political stance the work might seem to hold, as critics and art historians often interpret. Even art that looks superficially virtuous can be immoral. A minimalist, minimalist piece can be as self-indulgent and false as a painting that tells a politically correct tale. A work of art is a system of value judgments that reveals the character of the maker. So the morality of a work boils down to the artist's balance of love and detachment in the choices made. Art, wrote John Dewey, has been the means of keeping alive the sense of purpose that our own evidence and of meanings that transcend indirect habit. Then he goes on to quote Shelley, the great secret of morals is love, or a going out of our nature and the identification of ourselves with the beautiful which exists in thought, action, or person, not our own. We sustain our sense of purpose and our perception of meanings by confronting the burning flame that is always at the core of the resonant artwork. This flame hungers to consume our separate to consume what separates us from the world and from what's transcendent in ourselves. If we are receptive, such a confrontation extends both outward and inward. A profound painting for which we're ready invites us to step outside ourselves while revealing what has always been, and through it, we discover the wholeness we have lost. At the, onset, at the outset of a work of art, the flame lies within the realm of possibilities. But lighting it is not easy, in part because it's rare to have the power to do it, and in part because even if one has the power, it can be disorienting and exhausting to remain authentic and invested while rubbing two sticks together for a long time without guarantees a spark will ignite. Yet, for all the reasons I have mentioned and suggested, there's, there's nothing I'd rather do despite the likelihood that my efforts will end in failure. So, to conclude this talk, 
and transition to the conversation with Marty, I would like to share with you what that effort looks like for me with this video we prepared for you. Thank you. And now we're going to bring... I would like to invite, like to invite Martin Brest.
to come um, to join me in a conversation. From the sacred to the profane. Um, wow, that was beautiful. Uh, Enrique and I have been friends for a very long time. The prospect of having a conversation uh, is rather daunting, even though every time we get together, we, we can converse for 12 or 14 hours until we conk out. However, my rule, which I never told you for the conversations, is that I tell myself to just shut up and listen. So that's going to be a little challenging for this format. Um, Enrique and I have been friends for uh, 20 plus years, and uh, I consider him not only a friend, uh, but a, uh, a teacher, uh, as uh, artists, as far as I'm concerned, should be. Uh, I look to find something to take my life and consciousness to another level and work. And with Enrique's work, which I find, even though I know it fairly in depth for a civilian, um, I continually find it impenetrable in the most exquisite of ways. I find it like that carrot that dangles from the stick in front of a donkey that keeps the donkey moving forward. I can never wrap my arms around it. Uh, in fact, sometimes when I see new work for the, for the first time, I find it off in a way because it's ungraspable. It doesn't, there's something off, there's something wrong, the things don't knit in a way, but they provoke. And the longer you spend with them, they, that provocation continues on and on and on and on. And uh, that, they're sort of like thought machines. They're like uh, soul-lifting, self-educating, provocation machines, uh, and almost more like writing, in a way, than what would be considered painting in our time. It, uh, uh, you know, we've talked many times about how I, I just am incapable of grasping poetry. I just, I don't know what it is. It's some sort of uh, learning disorder. Po poetry to me is in, in, ungraspable. I don't understand what it is even. However, and, We've talked about this a lot. His paintings have, to some extent, opened up the parts of my mind that uh, can embrace poetry to some extent. Because to me, they're as poetic as I, was, I would hope to uh, integrate into myself. Um, you know, one of the things I was thinking about as, we were, as I was watching the film when I first met Enrique, he had a, a gallerist out in Venice before Venice was Venice. And uh, the gallerist, Billy, kept a binder of the most horrendous art that he clipped out of art magazines, like really painful stuff. And he would put it in these little glassine things. And he had, do you remember this? And I said, well, what is that? Why are you doing that? I mean, the stuff was like paint. He'd like look at, he'd show me something, he'd say, look at this. And it would be horrible. And, and I said, what is this about? He, and then he said, and this stuck with me forever. He said, if you had 30 seconds to live, and you knew you had 30 seconds to live, would you want to look at this? And I thought, what an amazing criteria. <coughs> if, you had 30 sec if you knew you had 30 seconds to live, what would you think is something OK to look at? What, something you'd rather just close your eyes and be with yourself? What would you like to listen to? What, what would be an acceptable engagement if you had 30 seconds to live and knew it? Now, whatever that means uh, is one of the reasons I find Enrique's work so compelling because all of his work passes the 30 second test. Um, and why that is, is uh, as long as I know the work and as long as I know Enrique and I've had the privilege of being uh, uh, guided into it by him and, and sort of uplifted by that guidance, um, it's still a mystery in the most exquisite way. 
uh, you know, when I was watching this last clip, I was thinking, somebody once said about Katherine Hepburn that she was so brilliant in her performances that she knew to leave room for the score. That in her acting, she knew that there was going to be a score, and she would allow room for this thing that's yet to be created to fill in. And I noticed that your work allows room for the score, that it, music works with it, which is uh, some more magic. Help me. <laughs> Throw me a lifeline. <laughs> you do <doing> good. <laughs> so, uh, you know, all I can say is that uh, the association, as I said to Marie <coughs> once before, that our friendship is one of my most valuable possessions. Uh, so maybe I should say how, how we met, um, just to, you hear an echo? Yeah. I don't know what it is. So, um, so when Marty and, and I met, he came to my studio. I've heard about him from Billy. And he came to my studio. He was me, that mic is on. Let me do a little professional work here. <laughs> um, try now. No, can you hear me? No, it's better? Wow, <laughs> the old geezer still got one in them. <laughs> so, um, I, um, Marty came to my studio, it was like four o'clock in the afternoon. We stood in the middle of the space. And then we stood in the same place for hours and hours. The sun went down. We were in the same studies. I don't even know what, I have no idea what we talked about. All I remember is the presence that Marty had and the intensity of the conversation. And at some point, it was totally dark. We didn't turn off any lights. And then we tried to fumble our way back out of the studio. And, um, and he has been sort of like that ever since. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, as uh, I'm sure everybody that knows Enrique knows that he has a daunting intelligence and a uh, deep reservoir of knowledge in every arena. I mean, he's actually a Renaissance man in the true and ancient definition of the word in a way that there aren't really. And uh, when, whenever I'm about to engage with him, even as we speak right now, uh, I think, well, how, where can I, uh, what level can I find to sort of uh, converse with this guy? Like, how can, and it just, it, somehow it happens that you very generously uh, readjust your gauge to accommodate my limitations. Uh, but somehow, despite that disparity of uh, intellect, uh, there is a common ground of, uh, I wouldn't even know what to, how to describe it, uh, of just, being una unafraid to reveal one's inadequacies, perhaps. You know, that's the ability to sort of be uh, emotionally naked uh, in a way coupled with, with aesthetic concerns uh, and uh, our individual pursuits and what we're both trying to do with our lives. Uh, that creates a, a, a unique bond of friendship that I'm very grateful for. It never fails to uh, elevate me. Enrique? Um, <laughs> you know, I think that one of the things that happens to, to anyone, I mean to all of us, I think, but certainly to artists, I remember years ago a poet that used to say that a poet is always looking for a third reader. I think because everyone has at least one person, but it's the third, the next person that is willing to read your work and understand it and relate to it. 
And that search for that third reader is, um, is difficult. You know, most of the time, uh, unlike a movie director, most of the time when you work in a studio, you work in isolation. You're having conversations with, with people that mostly are dead in your head, um, with fragments of paintings of, or works that you, that are, you know, are, they were, to begin with, not human beings, but you're still having a conversation with them. And the process can be quite isolating. Then you go to exhibitions and so on, and the isolation continues in a manner, in a way, even though people relate to it, or some people relate to it. But the difference is to have these kinds of conversations that we have had over the years, um, and, and more than the conversation. One of the things that I have appreciated, and it's not just a chumminess here, it's actually a very important, a very important quality, I think, um, of our friendship is, uh, is to feel less alone, less alone as an artist. I think uh, you know, I think Freud ideas that you know Freud wrote that the artist, the artist wants honor, power and the love of women. That was Freud's idea. My own, I, my own sense of it, that in some ways the artist is trying to um, transcend some fundamental loneliness at some, in some way. And, and that sometimes comes with people who make a connection, who live with your work, or who appreciates it. Um, and in the case of our relationship, we have a relationship that exists at many levels, but one of our, those levels is um, is these conversations we have had over the years, and um, which also intersect with what Marty does. Of course, I don't know anything about film. Um, so over the years, that also have been a thing that has augmented my experience in the things that you have provided, the insights, um, your surgical precision in observations. We have uh, have taught me something about the capacity to be light in your thoughts in a way that um, I am more heavy like a like a like a cow, and you're <laughs> you're you're you have a, a lightness that I admire very much, and has taught me something about that light intelligence as it moves quickly and surgically cuts through what matters. Um, and that has been quite useful. Um, so you have collected my work for a while. Why? <laughs> because it completes me. No. Uh, <laughs> because uh, they're like... Uh, psychic treadmills. They're, they're things that when I engage with them, they, uh, they elevate me, they, they expand me, they tickle me, they stimulate me, they provoke me, they teach me, they expand me perpetually, which is sort of you know, the, the, the criteria for art for me. Um, and it's, it's rare. Uh, there's a, another painter in the house who I adore, Oliver Arms. Uh, similarly, his, his work uh, elevates me as well. Um, for me, that's, you know, because I live internally so much, uh, as I'm sure you do, uh, and, you know, that internal playground is is my place and things that are uh, that that take me on trips in that place and continue to and not only don't tire out but continue to elude and expand and stimulate over time and and when one gate looks at that trend of stimulation over time that's an education in its own uh, they're teachers, basically. 
that would be the answer, that your work are teachers in the, in the best way, thrilling teachers, as opposed to, you know, uh, attractive paintings that, you know, that criteria of, of art that, you know, something that's, uh, uh, you know, stimulating visually or, you know, all the criteria that, that draws various people to various work. Uh, yours uh, carries me over time uh, in a way that, uh, that, that strengthens my soul. So that's why I saw there. I mean, I'm not, you know, I have zero academic qualifications to talk about art. <laughs> Obviously, you know, those who are academic here in that department have picked that up. But I'd like to think that my heart's in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and for me, you know, everybody finds their own value system in, in whatever, in relationships, in their work, and how they choose to make money, and, uh, you know, how they vote. Everybody has a value system. And, uh, and your, the value system of your work is, to me, exemplary, unique. Uh, you know, I think you, you're, you stand as an outlier in, in what you do. Uh, as near as I can assess. Um, you know, in a way, I, I think people are well served if they're given a, a road into your work so that they can be allowed to understand that this is more than just the kind of paintings that people see in galleries and, and, and contemporary museums. It's another thing. It's something more akin to poetry or literature or philosophy or dreaming. Uh, so sometimes I think people are, are served if they can be given a way into it. And then once they, they're led into that door, uh, it's up to them to go as far as they can or as far as they wish. Have you enjoyed going to museums with me? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, yes. But no, going to museums with you is sort of like uh, trying to have a Seder in a concentration camp. It's, <laughs> it's a, you're, you're very severe about your tastes and you're very uh, commanding in your uh, 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 dissertations about work. And uh, we disagree about a lot of work. And I find that disagreement elevating sometimes amusing, uh, but never unenlightening. Um, so I do enjoy going to museums with you, but it's not a walk in the park, you know. It's, it's, uh, it's a challenge. But I've seen you stand in front of paintings that I liked, that you didn't like. I, I, I'm thinking of a, uh, a Lee Krasner painting, which I adored. You didn't care for this particular painting. And after you had looked at it once, you then, looking at me, you pointed to all the different passages in the painting and, and, and said, oh, this impresses you the way the white was then corrected to this and that and this and this. Mm -hmm. And then she thought this here and then she did that to this to make this resonant with that. You, you broke down the whole painting disliking it. Made me appreciate it more, ironically. <laughs> but uh, that was a great experience. Do you like going to museums with me? No, <laughs> that's all. No, I do. I do like going to. You know, like I, I um. For me, the experience of more cult, most cultural institutions is a lot less fun than older I get. Um, but some museums I really like, and then Marty, Marty's much more aware of what's happening in our world than I am. So whenever we go to New York, we sometimes go and venture off to a museum, which is always an adventure. Um, so I enjoy it. I enjoy uh, seeing the enthusiasm they have. And I try really hard, contrary to what he's saying, to, to remain really positive. Um, so, you know, but, you know, like the reason why my taste is so narrow in, in, in art is not, and again, sort of like I said in my talk, it's not a reflection of my understanding of my own work. It's not to say 
my own work is great, and this is why I don't enjoy this stuff. It has nothing to do with my work. It has to do with the standards that were set up for me by works, not just visual works, but literature as well, of very high quality. And after that, I don't know how to work my way back other than supply and demand or production value, the fact that I cannot really have a Vermeer, so maybe I have something else. Um, so, so I don't really understand um, why be interested in anything other than that level of delivery. And the same is true with literature. Um, and again, one of the advantages of being an artist versus being, uh, I don't know, somebody running an institution is that I get to have this particular, very narrow taste. Um, they're not really tastes. Religions, maybe. Um, and, um, and I don't necessarily have to, to defend them, unless somebody's interested and have enough time to then do it. Um, I, 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 you know, for a while I wondered why you were so severe about paintings that you didn't care for or paintings that I enjoyed. You were very, you know, you, you hit me hard on not you didn't hit me hard on it, but you were severe about that. And then, I don't know how it happened, maybe a discussion of ours provoked it, but I thought about my relationship to movies and how uh, not that my movies have achieved the, the criteria I'm about to describe, but uh, I feel the same way about films that you probably feel about these paintings. So many films that people enjoy, I find intolerable, and I, I mean, I, and I can't watch them at all, uh, only because being intimately familiar with the act of creation, you sense right away what the morality, not the morality in terms of good or evil, but the ethical uh, 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 goals of a, of, a, of a work is. And you can tell if people are really doing it from an honest place, trying to hit uh, and open up you know, deeper areas, or they're just trying to sell tickets or, or occupy time uh, on a streaming thing or whatever. Um, and if I sense that it, it's the, the latter, I find it just intolerable. A friend of mine uh, once said that great food, his definition of great food is food that you feel great after eating. And you know, after you finish eating, you feel great. And I thought about that, well, that's like an interesting idea. I never thought about that definition for great food. You think great food is food that tastes great or whatever. But that's like an interesting thing, that you eat a meal and you feel great afterwards. And, and why is that? And how does that translate to art? Uh, and I came up with a little mathematical rule in my head, which is there's a, um, that the, the residue that you're left with after experiencing a movie or a play or a piece of music work of art not the aftermath, but after it all settles, the residue it leaves within you is a direct, um, I don't know if this is really true, I'll say it as if it's really true. It is directly related to the intention of the artist that created it. Not necessarily whether they succeeded or not, but what their intention was. If somebody's intentions had a certain kind of purity, and a certain kind of desire to achieve something special, you're likely to feel better after you've experienced it than if somebody's just trying to make money. Like a restaurant that's just trying to make a profit is likely to cut certain kind of corners that might seduce you but may not make you feel great when you're finished. When you, when you, if you've ever been to Las Vegas, which I've been rarely, uh, as soon as you step off the plane, you start to, I start to feel depressed because the every brick and mortar and tile and stoplight, everything in that city is about trying to pick your pocket. 
and somehow you pick that up subliminally when you get off the plane, that this is a place that's just trying to use all its tricks, its real intention is to take something from you. So, um, I forgot how we got onto this. No, I, I, but I want to see, like, the problem I have with the intentions that a lot of people talk about it is that there are a lot of people have good intentions. Like, if I, if I had a good or bad, I mean, it can no. be, uh, uh, because it qualified or not qualified might be a better way to say it. Yeah, like, you know, like, there's a, I have said this before, I don't know if it's true entirely, but I will say it now just to be difficult. Um, like, I think intentions do not matter. What matters is something underneath that. Because intentions are so hard to actually tap into what our real intentions are. Quite often, we, th we think we have an intention, but five layers below that intention, there's something else. You know, like, if, if I, no matter what intentions I have, I cannot write Ana Carolina. Um, and that's a problem. Um, and so, so what is it that one brings to bear into the work of art? And that, this is a very open question. Um, I tend to think, but everything that I would say sounds generic, and, and we don't have time to, to go past the generic. But I think there's something like, there's something like a, a form of character that goes into the work of art. I think there's a capacity of someone to, to be willing to, authenticity sounds charming, but what that often translate to authenticity is being willing to disrupt and destroy yourself in the process of doing it. I think that's required. Wait, so um, that you know, like authenticity quite often summons you to have to destroy your world system and sometimes yourself in the process if what you find in an authentic search is that you are an obstacle in the way. Very, very few people that have intentions are willing to do that. Um, and then, of course, you need a lot of other things to, be, to, to create a, work, a great work of art. You need, you need some of that flame that I was talking in the talk that is so difficult to do for anyone. And the proof that it's so difficult to do is you can see how much bad artwork is out in the world. Um, so, you know, I think what happens is in order for us to survive as such a large community and such a big world, we have to create some generalities of the way we approach almost everything. And our work, we are convinced that there have to be enough artwork floating around to satisfy this big world of ours. Um, and when, be, when I go sometimes to collectors' houses and I see this kind of work, and I see this kind of work, which often is interpreted by many collectors as a sign of their mental capacity to hold contradictory ideas at once, to me, it's kind of like belonging to two separate religions at the same time. And, and, and the courtesy that one pays to that encounter is to kind of, you know, there's a great passage in the Hagakura, the Book of the Samurai, that he says that there's a moment that he's ashamed for the other samurais, and he covers his eyes with his sleeve and pretends that dust is coming to his eyes. So he doesn't have to see what's happening. And sometimes, the only way to accept some of these things is to kind of tone down your capacity to probe. Because if some way, someone gives you two contradictory religious ideas, you will say, well, either you're a sociologist studying religions, or you're a believer. But there's no intermediate position. Um, and I think the same is true with, with art making. I think that people can hold, you know, can like these things, and you look at it, and it seems like a, a very sort of confused point of view. 
So when people talk about intentions, like I really, I mean, I read the whole talk there, and ultimately, the only thing that matters is what you bring forward, not your intentions. And I think that, anyway, do you want to say something? No. <laughs> Sometimes we'll, we'll talk about intentions for a long time. You know, like, I think, I think there's, a, there's a way, I think, um, I think we all want to be nice to each other. Not all of us, many of us don't want to be nice to each other. But let's say, in general, we have an understanding in a social engagement, in general, as yes, part of society, you want to be the person that is nice when somebody cooks you chicken, you say, oh, that's really good chicken. That was and good when chicken you cooked last night. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and then that's kind of, that kind of way, like it grees the social relationships, even if we don't really believe that. We can't go, we're, we're told we're not kind of go out there and really say what we think. But in the case of art, I'm often shocked um, by a really smart person, sometimes somebody who runs a company or, or does something, that seems to walk into a gallery or walk into a studio or a museum and see a work of art that is, it is hard to imagine that work of art in the continuum of all great pieces that have existed in the world and all great thoughts that have existed in the world and imagine that somehow that thing is in any way comparable to it. And then this person that is so brilliant will somehow uh, will listen to someone, or will whether it's the artist or whether it's the work itself, and say, "Well, that's really good," or "It's okay," and it's perceived that that person is being generous. And this time we shut up. I said this. They perceive that this person is being generous. But to me, it's the opposite of generosity. Because the price paid for that superficial dangling on the top is to all the people who have given their lives and their tremendous effort to make something meaningful and, and, and transcendent. And then we say, that somehow that that was made is somehow comparable to this other thing. And sometimes when I work, you know, like, so say we go to the Met, and the Met has had, I, let's say, not the Met itself, but say the collection has had thousands of years to look at what was good in some manner. And the good is always rotating depending on the understanding. But then when we get to the contemporary part of the Met, which of course my work happened to be in it, so I'm including myself in this attack. When you go in there, we had like 20 minutes to decide whether this work is any good. And of course there is a contemporary program, so no matter what, it has to be fit into it. Um, and I always think, I always feel so sad for the works in the other rooms that are kind of over there reminding us of what's possible. And they're so lonely out there and we come to the contemporary wing and everybody's so cute and, and um, clever. And, and I just, you know, like I want to take the other works home. Of course, I'll be arrested. But um, so, so there is something to that. There's cer certain violence that happens to the very idea of art, and how much I've been devoted to it by our triviality and and an acceptance of more. You know, is false generosity. I can understand that as a filmmaker viewing films. Yeah. When you devote yourself to 
something you, it hurts in a way to see things that don't have the proper intention. Oh, it's question time. Question time. He's got the hook. So we have a microphone. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So we have some microphones going around. So if you raise your hand, you can grab a microphone. Thank you so much for the conversation and for your reflections, uh, dear Enrique, earlier. Uh, I have a question and it's also a thought, and I'm really wondering, because I, it's always uh, a pleasure and a challenge to be exposed to your work at the same time. And. Uh, I want to connect my thought with what you said about your childhood and this movement from Cuba to Spain and then to Puerto Rico and then to California. <coughs> so you have been always in some way in, in sunny places, place with sun. But it's like very rarely to see sun in your paintings. We have like blackness or darkness, darkness more accurately occupies a massive place in your landscape, in your paintings. And it is not just darkness, it's also darkness and, and it's coldness. Some, I'm thinking about crown, the crown, for example. Uh, so I'm really curious about that, and I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to, to know what you think about that. And I'm not, I will not ask you about the intention, because you are reluctant to intention. But I would ask you to, what you think of it retrospectively, retroactively, when you finish the painting, when you go back to look at it. Because when I look at it, and I think of the connection between your painting and what you said, with poetry, and also with philosophy, psychoanalysis, you, you depict blackness and or darkness in landscape, but also this connects in some way to the unconscious. At least this is in my reading. So, yeah, I, I would love to know more about what you think of that and in relation to the loneliness or the solitude of the artist also. Because in, in Spanish it's uh, soledad for both loneliness and solitude. But in English we have two words and they have different uh, meanings in some way. So, yeah. I mean, I will start by sort of from the back of your question. So my son Adrian is here tonight, and uh, you know, like I raised him. I saw him when he was a baby. But by the time he gets to this age, he's 18 now, he's like an independent being. So whatever I say about him now is somewhat from a distance. I cannot be inside his head anymore. I mean, I never could, but closer when he was one, maybe. The same is true with my paintings. So everything that I will say about my work is from that same distance. I raised these paintings, and now they sit autonomous for me. And the reason why I, I want to say that first is because I want to disclaim the authority on talking about my work. Um, now, coming back to your question, um, I mean, I think in, in some ways, early on as a kid, I was in Cuba, I, I, there was a, a book of short stories by Tolstoy. I think that some of the imagery imprinted in my head early on. But I was always very moved by all kinds of Nordic imagery in poetry and literature and so on. So that probably has a, a, an influence, but at the same time, what came first? I was interested in these Nordic writings for probably because I had a, a certain interest in a, cert, in a way of looking at the world. That, that being said, my emotional education as an artist was by Spanish and Latin American literature. So it was with literature in my early teens that I understood what the emotional aims of art were. Um, I mean, like, if I only limit it to what was my day-to-day -day experiences, I will have a very much smaller world. But when I read, for example, uh, La Tregua by Mario Benedetti, and I understood what was 
possible in the world of emotion. Then I understood that there was, there was a whole other landscape. So to come back to your question, the strange thing about my paintings is that I don't look at them psychologically, and I don't look at it um, in terms of iconography. I don't look at it in almost any way that people look at them. So um, but winter, there's a certain starkness of the winter offers that the Caribbean foliage does not for me. Too complicated, the Caribbean foliage. I, it doesn't have a resonance to me. So when everything's stripped down like a winter, black is, a, is an amazing color in that every possibility is there and every denial of possibility is also in black. You can tune black in, 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 very, in very different ways. Um, and the final thing I'm going to say, and I wish that I could expand on what you're asking because it is a big question. I think it also the influence of philosophy and science into my work has something to do with it. Um, I look at my work in the way Marty talked about it. I looked at my work um, only, only peripherally as a visual art, art thing. I look at it as an inquiry primarily. When people say express, those kinds of terms that people use for our work, I never think of it that way. I start a work because I don't understand something, and I go after it to, to make sense of something, the way a philosopher will do a writing, the way a scientist will do an experiment. I have nothing a priori to convey about what the work will end. So the consequence of that, it restricts all kinds of decisions you can make by the very nature of that inquiry. So, um, so it's not about what I'm interested in, it's not about the past, what I bring into in terms of my likings. Many times, in, you can see this last sequence, there are paintings in there that I superficially like more than, than what it ended up. But what it ended up was a necessity and not a taste. Other questions? Um, hi, these pieces are so beautiful. Um, in various, there are various layers of longing, and that's what I see in your work. And I'm just intrigued by the presence of water because usually I see water as like life giving. Um, again, this is my perspective, but it's like a longing through water, like a, the water is there, but the thirst is never quenched. Even for the people in the painting, they never get, it seems like they're never getting what they want. You know, there's a, a longing for something continuously, and I just am interested in how you approach bringing, into, bringing your water into your pieces and the fact that they also seem to not give life, or do they give life? It's a good question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm from the Caribbean, and um, Garcia Marquez said this statement uh, a long time ago. He said, I'm not South American, I'm from the Caribbean. And they, there's, a, there's a certain thing that happens in the Caribbean, a sense of inferiority that we all Caribbean people share, as, you know, a sort of colonial history. <clears throat> um, a sense of always, um, trying to understand how we are in this very complicated life that we live. And the thing that modulates all those expectations is the sea. Um, and in Cuba in particular, I, I grew up in a little near, my grandparents have a little shack in a beach town that was very close to our house. And I spent a lot of time there. And the sea there was always a sea of expectations of looking at the horizon to see what will come from there. The shore that laps into, into the land sort of reminded you that it has always been like that for thousands of years, which in some ways made the impermanence of being by the shore so much clearer. And of course, everybody leaves 
the islands. An island is a very particular kind of thing. There is an insularism, a sense of being contained in a small piece of land founded by the sea is a very specific kind of experience, which I think in many ways mirrors our psyche. You know, we're all comfortable in a certain island, but beyond that boundary there's unknown and uh, scary things. So, so I think the sea more than the water has been important to me for many years, and I think I do share, I do agree with some of your assessment you think there. Um, I also think it's a counter of time. Time is very important to me, um, and sense of impermanence. And that longing that you see, uh, I mean, I can say something better if I had more time, but I think, I think longing is a fundamental condition of, of, of being who we are. A certain separation is for a whole, from a wholeness that I think all of us feel and ultimately causes a, a, an essential inherent longing at the heart of everybody. Um, and what you do about that, whether it's have a practice of, that helps you come to terms with it or get past that or get past whatever that condition is, is um, is what will allow you to return to that wholeness. And for me, that happens through art. I'm not a religious person. Um, so that's how I go about it. We have just two more questions. Two more questions. Um, one right back here. So uh, I'm in the graduate film and television division. Um, <laughs> And they tell us to be specific in which discipline that you want to go about um, your time here. Um, if you want to direct, okay, what genre do you want to direct and be specific in that? And I understand uh, the importance of mastering a specific craft, but um, I remember your exhibit here last spring and I was just so inspired. And that was my first semester and I was so inspired by how many different artistic expressions you tap into. Um, and I want to know how you go about, what's your method in not letting society or yourself, letting society box you in or to a specific uh, artistic expression or even your method of not boxing yourself in to one specific facet. And then Martin, I would love for you to weigh in considering, you know, Beverly Hills Cop, but then you go to um, um, meet J Joe Black and then Sin of a Woman is like its own little thing in the middle where it's draws, it, it's walking on that thin line of comedy um, and drama and having those beautiful moments within. So we'd like to hear both of your perspectives. Well, before you pass the mic away, can you, can you give him back the mic? <laughs> when you're asked to be restricted to a particular thing, what's your feeling about that imposition? I, I, I want to direct, but I want to learn everything. I want to learn about sound design. I want to learn about cinematography because I think that speaks to the power a director has. So I, I take it, I hear it, but at the end of the day, I'm... I'm you, got, you got the answer already. <coughs> That's the, I mean, I'm not speaking for artists, but for filmmakers or, I'll speak for artists too, for anybody who's creative. There is always, forgive me, especially in the academic environment, uh, sets of restrictions that you might viscerally feel are wrong for you. My money's on you. Your intuition about your own direction is likely to be the correct one. And if you feel some outside restriction is artificial for you, you're likely correct, I would think. That's not to say that there are, are certain things within these restrictions that are being thrown at you that uh, maybe are beyond your imagination and may actually help you. That's possible. But it, my money is on the person, on the creator, 
and how they feel about the imposition of restrictions, which goes all through life in every imaginable way. You know, there, there's always restrictions that creative people have to uh, not ignore, but th they don't necessarily have any bearing on what they have to contribute. So they always have to negotiate it in one way or another, uh, take from it whatever they can, and be true to themselves. So your internal, uh, uh, the friction you're sensing is legitimate and and you shouldn't allow your internal compass to be deflected. You should be open-minded about what's being presented to you, but your internal compass is all you got, basically. That's your real estate. So go with that, I would think. I mean, for, for me, I think it was a, a real difficulty as a young man. Coming, com <clears throat> coming from the family I came from and having been an immigrant to like physics, literature, art, philosophy, that was not a gift. That was a real, a, a real difficulty for me. I felt split, I felt divided. Um, my te this teacher suggested that I should do writing, this teacher suggested I do, to do physics. Um, my parents suggested I should be a doctor. Luckily, my brother became one. Um, <clears throat> so so uh, it was not good. So what I was going to, I will echo what Marty said, an age. I think it's funny when I, when I get introduced as Provost Professor of Humanities and Arts, part of me gets a little bit laughed because that comes from the teenager I was, not from my proper education, so to speak, from all those interests from having pursued as deeply as I could and as seriously as I could the things that truly moved me. Um, and if I was going to read philosophy, I was always upset that I will not know it well enough. You know, I didn't just want to be able to quote Foucault, as people like to quote these days. Instead, I wanted to understand it. So that, so that defined my journey. Um, and now, that's my life. My life is that, and my life, it feels that. So at the same time, you know, it's like the Rocky movie that you fight the world. And I don't want to oversimplify it. I know that it is difficult sometimes. And sometimes you need a mentor or a guidance, because a lot of the time, we, get, we think this is what we want. And it comes from some misunderstandings. So to guide, to guide you along, to make sure that you can sort out your choices properly, um, it's good to have somebody that, that can be that, that person for you. Because you know, we like to say, well, do whatever you want. But that's also a secret way to get really confused and lost forever. Um, so, so the combination when Marty said have somebody you trust is a very good thing. And there yeah. was one more question. Yeah, one last question right before. Hello, thank you for your presentation. I enjoyed it very much. And my question is, what is your perspective on artwork of pre-colonial societies such as the Mayas or the Taino people? versus that of artwork presented today in the 21st century? All right. Um, <laughs> has this been recorded? Uh, <laughs> so no, I, I, am, I am ignorant of it. In fact, it's funny that you asked me that, because I, just, I was at the Denver Art Museum that has an incredible collection of Mesoamerican work, which I spent a lot of time with just this past week. Um, looking at things that I never have never seen, that level of, of uh, accomplishment. The, the problem for me is that I am, I am in a similar way like the Mayans approach their work, for instance. That for them, the work was not an artwork, but rather an in, integral part of their life and social structure. Since I don't have any relationship to 
to that social structure or to life other than what I intellectually can teach myself or somebody can teach me. I can, only, I can be fascinated, I can learn, I can marvel at some of those incredible works. But my life, the way I approach our work is to make sense of my life, to understand and make better choices than the ones I make to make sense of what this is here, what reality is. And for that, some sort of Aztec work and so on doesn't, doesn't do it for me in that regard. Doesn't mean it has no value, it has a profound value. But the value is inaccessible to me for the use that I want to have for art. And to add to that, so, so every word I'm, I'm choosing, I'm trying to choose it carefully. Many people who say they love art or study art, whether it's Mesoamerican work, pre-colonial, whatever it may be, I often go to their houses and I don't see any art in their walls. I don't see any love for it. I see a lot of thought. I see galleries that, that have like nothing going on in their house. They know what auction did what, but they don't, I don't see any love for it. And I think when you have no love for the thing, you can have a huge latitude of appreciation because the appreciation you have can remain at the level of study, at the intellectual level. Um, and insisting that the work figures centrally in your life, not as just something you like, or something that your life pivots around, is a different requirement, and that's a requirement I have for me. So when I come for, for example, pre-colonial, or even colonial paintings of Latin America, I find it so incredibly moving, so beautifully. But I look at them as I look at, from my standpoint. Like I just saw at Denver, this, four beautiful paintings of Christ in, um, in these colonial paintings, and I thought they were incredibly moving. But, but I'm, I'm not a practicing Catholic. I have no idea what they were used for. I look at them from the distance of stripping out of that work all its context, and I'm looking at it just for the emotional quality of the making. And I know that's what I'm looking at it as. So that was not a very good answer, but, but, um, but it's sort of uh, come to it with respect, I suppose. So. Well, Marty, Enrique. We are expanded, we are elevated, to use your words, Marty, and uh, I think we understand that essential human condition of loneliness that art helps us confront and uh, probably just um, add more dimensions to, depending on how we face it. I want to thank all of you for being here. It was a wonderful, wonderful talk, a wonderful conversation. We have a lovely reception out in the back for you, right out the doors. And uh, on behalf of Visions and Voices, uh, another great evening at USC. Thank you. Thank you.